Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Atticus LeBlanc of Pad Split coming to us from Atlanta. How's your day going, Atticus? It's going great so far, Nathan. Appreciate it. Is it um, nice and hot in Atlanta already? Are you guys entering? Yeah, it's still springy here. Um, it depends on the day. It's, you know, they say in Atlanta, if you don't like the weather, just wait four days. So, uh, <laughs> last, last night it cooled off a little bit, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's beautiful here today. Are you a native uh, Georgian? No, I, I grew up in New Orleans, actually. So uh, I, I lived there until I went to college and uh, then was in the Northeast for a little while, but was desperate to get back to the South and warmer climates and friendlier cultures. Interesting. Warmer climates, friendlier cultures. Uh, yeah, I wonder if those two things probably go hand in hand, right? <laughs> Unquestionably. Um, very good. Well, pad split. Tell us what you guys do. Sure. So we are an affordable housing marketplace. And effectively, what we do is uh, we leverage housing as a vehicle for financial independence for low and middle income Americans, namely singles and couples under $35,000 a year total income. And there are a couple of different levers that we pull to, uh, to effectively make affordable housing profitable so that it is actually possible. Uh, the, the primary one is we use shared housing. So we take an existing unaffordable house or apartment and we create a shared living environment to make it more affordable for more people while also being more profitable for underlying landlords, investors, or property owners. Okay. And I mean, it's kind of sounds like what, you know, recent college grads have been doing since day one, I guess. What's yeah. the, what's the hook here? Sure. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's not a, certainly sharing a house is not a new concept. It's been done for, for hundreds of years and it's certainly not new for our income demographic where there are simply no options that, uh, that exist, uh, particularly for, for people in the uh, minimum wage to $25,000 a year category. Our average income is about $21,000 a year. What, what is different and the easiest uh, analogy that I can make is uh, think of uh, Uber or Lyft compared to hitchhiking, right? What is the difference between those two things? The act is fundamentally the same. You are getting into the back of the seat, back of a car with a stranger, right? Um, but I don't think anyone would ever confuse hitchhiking and Uber or Lyft. Uh, there is legitimacy and accountability to those platforms uh, that effectively make them work and make them scale. And so, if you look at our business and if you're familiar with the term rooming houses or boarding houses, uh, things that were very commonplace a hundred years ago that are much less common today, uh, what is the difference between what we do and what a rooming house does? And the difference is primarily that, you know, we are a legitimate and accountable organization. It's, it's a branded enterprise that still allows you to create individual contracts so that you're responsible for your own, living environment, but we layer in a lot of different technologies uh, and accountability to, to be able to, uh, to build this platform you can trust so that you know uh, all of the other members in your house are uh, background checked, for instance. Mm. Uh, you know that we are including all of the utilities, Wi-Fi, laundry, uh, and there's a certain level of standard that you know you're gonna get regardless of which pad split you may be walking into. Um, so for instance, it's not, uh, a, uh, a random place that, that you, that you may not have any idea where you're going, but something akin to like a Hampton Inn, any Hampton Inn you walk into anywhere across the country, you know exactly what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's our underlying goal as well. That makes sense. That makes sense. Cause I feel like, I mean, back in my, my younger days, I lived with, I think one of my funnest times was. In my 20s, I lived in Haight Ashbury in a big Victorian with like five women and me. And it was a really fun situation. It was like, you know, just a really fun scene. But of course, 
as I re- think back, it's always like arguments about who paid the bills or like, you know, exactly. who's the master leaseholder. All those things are always the downside of that sort of living situation, right? Yeah, so, so. This, this, is, this is very turnkey. It's, I mean, you can move in within 48 hours. You are responsible for only yourself. Now, we, we certainly have an expectation that every member of Pad Split uh, that becomes a resident can behave as a kind, independent, and respectful adult. But as long as you can meet that criteria, it, it works out. And it doesn't matter if uh, all of your roommates uh, stop paying their bills. As long as you are still paying yours, you're in good shape. And so that's my next question. Do you take the lease of the household and you're sort of subdividing that lease or is someone else have the lease? So it's, it's a little bit different than, than most co-living platforms. We, we really are membership based. If you're familiar with uh, the co-op form of ownership, that's probably the easiest way to explain it is uh, it's almost like a a co-op for a rental where, and the reason why we refer to our residents as members is because each of them uh, effectively uh, become member owners of, of that entity. And uh, the, it, it functions similar to a lease, but the big question is just on the, uh, on the zoning and legality side, uh, how do we structure that? Because rooming houses or boarding houses uh, are prohibited in a lot of different zoning ju- jurisdictions. And so our structure allows us to operate in a lot of those same districts and, and function as a, as a family um, per se. Okay. So, I don't know. I guess I didn't really get the answer to the question, but I, I kind of get it. What's a tip? Maybe give a typical scenario or your most common scenario. Is it who's the leaseholder? So, so we create an entity that holds the lease. So our, we have owners, landlords that own the property and they improve the properties to our specifications. Okay. We create an entity that holds the lease and the, the different members become uh, part of that entity. I get it. And how do you police for the bad apple, the, the, the guy who you let in, who's just, you know, coming home sure. at whatever, 4 a.m. and waking everyone up and can the other members vote yeah. him out or, you know, how's it work? Yeah, so it, it's not dissimilar from, from what we've seen from the ride sharing apps or Airbnb or any other uh, part of the sharing economy that we've, we've seen over the last 10 years, where in our model, members have the ability to rate each other. Uh, in inside the platform as well as rate their accommodations and so in that way we, we try to align incentives across everybody who may be living in the house uh, as well as the owners who are actually providing the housing makes sense yeah that's totally logical very interesting and what's the backstory where'd you come up with this was it a personal uh, problem you're experiencing or just a, a interesting opportunity you saw so I've, I've been an affordable housing investor and developer for about 12 years here in Atlanta. And so I really got to understand the, the huge demand for, uh, for housing and, and just what I'll call the misalignment of incentives across the industry. Uh, I have, I've worked with a number of traditional government subsidy programs. I've been a public private partner with the city of Atlanta. Uh, and I was very familiar with the, the affordable housing complex that, uh, and, and how they create additional units. And I, I saw some fundamental flaws, not just in that process, <clears throat> excuse me, but, but also just the way that the, the traditional real estate um, rental industry was set up. So for instance, why would any landlord make any energy efficiency improvements to the property when they know that the tenant is on the hook to pay those, to pay those utilities? Um, the answer is they don't usually, right? That even if it's something simple like swapping out the 60 watt incandescent light bulb for the seven watt LED, even though the cost is, is not significant. And so I took a lot of these, uh, what I'll call misalignments and tried to just create a new system and, mm-hmm. and a housing paradigm that, that aligned all these interests. And rather than the, the typical government process uh, of creating affordable housing where you provide subsidies, I wanted to see how efficient a system we could make so that we could take advantage of existing residential spaces and provide affordable housing, but also more importantly, to demonstrate to private market owners 
uh, how affordable housing could actually be more profitable than market rate alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's, uh, that just makes a lot of sense in so many reasons. I think figuring out ways to make things that are socially desirable, profitable is the way, right way to go. I mean, this is a tangent, but like, I just think about the oceans and plastic and the plastic issue we're facing is like someone has to figure out a way to harvest that plastic, for example, in a profitable way. And then it gets solved very quickly, but until it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not solvable almost. So anyway, tangent, but yeah, I like that approach. Appreciate Good. It. Um, how much you guys raised? How many rounds? Um, so we, we got pretty lucky. I'd, I'd say, um, the, the, we've officially only had one, one round and that was our, our last seed, of $4.6 million. Uh, we sought out, we sought out to raise 4 million and we were pretty significantly oversubscribed and eventually willed it down to, to 4.6. Prior to that, we had actually got a non-dilutive line of credit from a foundation, uh, mm. just because of the, the social impact nature of what we were working on. And that's a loan. Uh, the good news is it's non-dilutive. Mm -hmm. The bad news is you got to pay it back. But as a, as a real estate guy, I, I really had very little aversion to, to debt. Um, I, it was something I was, I was pretty comfortable with, particularly under the right terms. And uh, yeah, we just closed our, uh, our official seed round, which is really what I'll call the growth round, um, about three and a half weeks ago, I guess. Yeah, cool. Right, let's talk about the debt, because on this, this show, we haven't really talked about debt financing very much. Um, I don't know if you can share numbers or how much, but, uh, you know, could you just finance this all on debt given the sort of cash flow model of your business or well, I guess you, why, why, why raise an equity round if you don't yeah, have so, so I guess you could finance everything with debt if you could get enough of it and convince people that you, you had the capacity to pay back. Um, but that, that doesn't usually exist, which is why there's a market for venture capital. Yeah. The, uh, you know, for us, it, we got a million dollar line of credit. Uh, we ended up using, uh, I think, Five hundred thousand dollars of it before we we did our growth. We never really viewed that as as growth capital, though. Um, we we viewed it as building out this local enterprise and getting us started. Uh, and perhaps maybe in the way that most people would think of a of a traditional seed round, at least a seed round, as of a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think don't get me wrong. If, if we had the ability to go get a, a, a a $10 million line of credit at, at 4% non-dilutive, that would be really, really attractive. And I think that's not limited to, to our business, but that's any business. The reality is no startup really has the balance sheet to justify that. Uh, for, for us, we just happened to get really lucky early on that, that we had a foundation that bought into our mission. Um, but there's no, there's no way we would have gotten that uh, had we not been mission driven. Mm, yeah, interesting. Is that credit or is that, uh, is the interest rate lower than like say market rate because of uh, the source of the capital? Are they sort of subsidizing the interest rate? Uh, to some extent. Yeah. It was just, uh, you know, a lot of these foundations just have, have cash. Mm -hmm. and it's a question of what, what do they really want to do with it? Are they, what goals are they trying to achieve? Is it, is it a mission goal? And I think for, for most of the foundations that I've talked to, repayment of capital is a bonus. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or that is, that's the gold standard, right? If they, if they get paid back with any uh, amount of interest, that's the extent of their, of their mindset. Whereas a, a VC is looking for 100x or 1,000x. And so it's just a very different frame of, frame of mind when, when they're approaching the, the funding side of things. I want to touch on the, or I want to keep, keep on this thread because the, you are the first <laughs> one in nine and over a hundred episodes. I think that we've had someone that's raised money from a foundation. So maybe talk about what is a foundation? How did you identify the right foundations? How did you get in touch with them? Give us the whole. So, story. Uh, so there, there are a couple different things. First, we actually launched the idea out of, I created a white paper as part of an affordable housing competition, an ideas competition, and they wanted affordable housing ideas that could scale. So uh, truth be told, I guess we've, we've, been, we've been funded by, by two different foundations. Uh, the first was Enterprise Community Partners, uh, and that, they ran the, the uh, competition, but mm -hmm. that was a small check. That was uh, JP Morgan Chase Foundation, Enterprise Community Partners, 
that was just $10,000, but it was still enough to, to tell me, okay, there's something here and this is something I want to focus on. The, we talked to a couple other foundations after that. And I think the unique part is obviously housing is in the public discourse right now. There are a lot of people talking about it. There are a lot of foundations that are trying to figure this out and they're frustrated by the lack of progress from any of the um, traditional sources or any public sources. And they see a need to move much faster than we are if we're actually going to, to solve anything. Sure. We're, we're definitely in a unique space there, but it's just like anything else. Just like if you're researching venture capital firms, uh, you, you take that exact same approach and you start researching foundations to figure out who's trying to solve what problem and who might be a fit and who you have connections to or who you can network to. Uh, but the process is, is almost identical. Uh, the difference is they're, they're typically uh, much harder doors to open. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but it's certainly a source that's out there for, for any mission-driven organization. But th if there's no mission, then there's no point. And just for anyone that's not clear, what is a foundation specifically? I don't think we have uh, to say. So, uh, you know, a foundation is, is effectively, uh, it, depends, it depends on who you're talking about, but it, it's, a, it's a tax sheltered uh, nonprofit or uh, often either family funds or large uh, independently wealthy uh, individuals. Um, or in, in some cases, it's, it's institutional level foundations um, that have billions of dollars in assets under management. And they have effectively created a, a charitable endeavor to, to deploy capital to achieve the, uh, the, the sh social endeavors that, that they're focused on. Yeah, I guess the one I, that comes to mind, I don't know too much about this, but like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? Aren't they aimed at uh, solving some hunger and medicine issues? Um, yeah, ba basically after people have made a lot of money and they want to start giving it away, they create a foundation. And do foundations from what you know, is you got a, a non-dilutive line of credit, a loan, a debt. Are most foundations doing that sort of structure or more donations um, or, you know, what are the formats, I guess, of foundation? Yeah, so I, I would say it's much more common to hear of grants, <laughs> nonprofit uh, type endeavors. The, I haven't heard of too many giving non-dilutive lines of credit. You're starting to hear more about that as this whole social impact investing culture is, is becoming uh, more popular and better known. Mm -hmm. Uh, and foundations are, in my opinion, starting to think of themselves uh, as much or more as investors as they are charities. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. That makes sense. And so a little bit more on this, we'll go to the equity round, but um, how did you actually get in touch with the foundation that you ended up taking this line of credit from? Do they have an application process? Is it personal networking? What? Yeah, personal networking in, in this particular case. And, you know, I found it doesn't matter what it is. It's almost always comes down to personal networking one way or the other. So you got an intro and then is the pitch to a foundation more about the social benefit than the Absolutely. return or what? It, it's, for us, it's both and. It's, it's that there's going to be massive social benefit. So we knew that at the time uh, we were saving folks. We only knew about $400 a month. Um, that we were saving folks uh, who were making around twenty thousand dollars a year. Actually, that number is closer to five hundred now, but that was a big part of it. And so you can imagine, you don't have to serve that many people before you you make a really significantly outsized impact. Uh, so that was a big part of the pitch. And then the other pitch was, or the other part of it was that we have the we have the economic model to be able to repay the debt over time in in a reasonable amount of time. Is your model suitable for, I can see it being very suitable if like the scenario I described, you're right out of college, you're starting your first job, you're not making much money. Is it suitable for people like transitioning out of homelessness, maybe with some, you know, Absolutely. issues? Yeah, yeah, so what most people don't realize that there's this term uh, chronically homeless, which is uh, federally defined, uh, that, that's much more strict, that, that fits within most people's definition of homelessness. 
but we like to think about uh, functionally homeless. And so about 40% of our population has experienced some form of functional homelessness over the last two years. And what that means is they've either had to couch surf because they got evicted, uh, they had to spend a couple nights in their car. In some cases, they slept in the airport lobby because they were in between places. Uh, and, and the real way to think about it is just housing instability uh, or housing insecurity mm. and acknowledging that folks who are working full time more often than not just don't have enough income to support themselves in the existing options that are available in any jurisdiction. You take minimum wage, for instance, Anybody who's working federal minimum wage, 725 an hour is getting about 1280 a month, which means under any uh, criteria for, for housing, uh, they're only gonna qualify for something that's around $430 a month. In most jurisdictions, that just simply doesn't exist. And so there are, there are a lot of people out there who, who fall under that functionally homeless category, even though they're working full time. Yeah, yeah. We see them here in San Francisco in the, and the RVs, you'll see a string of RVs lined up and I don't know, there's probably some functionally homeless and some chronically homeless in, in yeah. there, but yeah, it's pretty powerful. Um, okay, let's go to equity. Uh, so talk about raising that round. Who led the round? I've got a list of some names here, but I'd like to maybe hear you describe it. So, so Core Innovation Capital led the round. They are a uh, social impact fintech startup or okay. uh, investor primarily and their mission is democratizing prosperity for everyday Americans so it was, it was a really nice mission fit for us interesting yeah I'm not familiar with them that sounds great and do they have sort of the double bottom line approach I mean they're a VC but they're trying to they do almost almost all of our our certainly all of our institutional VCs if it wasn't part of their investment thesis uh, publicly stated that they were, that they were social impact driven, I at least got the sense from talking to the principals that they understood the benefit and they were aligned personally. So that was, that was a really important part of uh, the way that I was evaluating VCs going forward. Cause you know, it's, it's a big part of who we are and it's in our DNA. So how did you identify, how did you build the list, build the funnel? Um, is there some database that you that shows all the different kind of social impact investors out there, or where did you identify these folks? No, no, unfortunately not. Uh, it, you know, and in that sense, it, it took me longer than it probably should have. Uh, the The first set of connections uh, were primarily through TechStars. So we finished the TechStars Atlanta cohort uh, in October of this year, and there's no question I would I would recommend TechStars to anybody. Um, as someone who had some, some doubts about the value before I started, all doubts were erased very, very shortly into the program. And just the size and the breadth of the network from that organization was pretty incredible. So undoubtedly, uh, that helped us a tremendous amount. And then just coming out of Demo Day and being able to have uh, a really solid pitch that was watched by a bunch of VCs in the audience uh, gave us a, a huge springboard to be able to start the fundraising process. We did not start fundraising uh, until I'd say right around Thanksgiving or so, which I would recommend is not necessarily the best time mm -hmm. to start a process, but we just simply weren't ready when we finished Techstars in October. But it was, uh, it was a lot of networking, honestly, from there. And just Treating, treating people like you would want to be treated and, and trying to keep your, your head up and understanding that, that they are professionals and they're professional investors and understanding the lens that, that they're looking through when, when they're evaluating. But we had a really long list that, that we went through. Inevitably, though, it was what it came down to was for us, getting someone to see our product um, from the outside and... The first was probably Kapor. They were one of the other institutional investors, obviously a, a very well-known social impact investor. Mm -hmm. And they happened to be in town at uh, the Venture Atlanta event. And they saw us at Techstars Demo Day. And we had the opportunity to give them a tour of some of the homes that were operating. Oh, cool. And so they were, they were another one that, that really gave us just a ton of different introductions. But we'd, we've been getting introductions, I guess, probably for the last 13, 14 months or so. 
just introductory calls. I forget who said it. If it might have been Techstars, they talk about uh, relationships that are lines and not dots. Right? It's it's a lot easier to to come back and ask somebody for money if the first time you're seeing them is not asking for money. Yeah. And, and to build those relationships over time and to demonstrate that you're a straight shooter and you're going to execute and, and do what you said you were going to do. Yeah. Good. Um, you, you said you didn't actually start raising until after Techstars. So I guess, why were you not ready? What, what, what does it mean to be ready to raise money and, or not ready? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the easiest way I can explain that is we felt like we, we could come up with a, a plan for how we were going to spend the money. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't know how you were going to spend the money, then you're not ready to raise the money. That's, that, that's probably it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, and, and I felt like the business was not at a point early on where we had built our own foundation to be able to, uh, to go out and look somebody in the eye and say, I want you to give me a million bucks or two million bucks or whatever it is. Uh, and, and to feel like, I had put forth all of the, the research that I needed to and sufficiently developed our model and operations to be able to deploy that capital. Did you have to have a, a kind of a, a, a proof point of a, maybe a single house or a couple houses that show and you can, you know, get a lease at this amount, subdivide it kind of the, the, um, mm -hmm the arbitrage model that I think, you know, people talk about like we work, right. They're leasing floors at this amount and renting it back out. Did you have to have a full cycle of that before you could go raise? Um, that was part of it. Uh, you know, early on in the process, investors were more concerned about what I'll say the supply side of our businesses, uh, which is the, the availability of, of homes from, from other investors. I was, I, I've been an investor myself for a long time. So it was very easy for me to step into the shoes of myself, right? And, and know how I would look at, at this. Um, so I never really had much concern about availability on the supply side. The, the harder thing, which was not, um, was not looked at nearly as, as closely was just the complexity of the operations piece. And I think that's probably because I knew that, that better than most of the VCs of just how complex the operations was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for me, it was, it was just getting that comfort level that this is something that I could grow, that, that I could go out and hire people and plug them into this, uh, this machine and make it grow. <laughs> I'd say as seamlessly as possible, although we're all running startups. So we know it's going to be really, really, really messy. Um, but at least feel comfortable to the point where, you were, you were ready to grow. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, good. What's the one thing you learned in Techstars that maybe you took close to heart beyond the network benefits? Like what, you know, yeah. what's the one little nugget that you really stuck out Weekly at you? Updates. Weekly updates have been huge. So sorry, sorry, say it one more time. Uh, weekly updates. Uh -huh. So it, during the program, they, they force us to do updates weekly and report on your KPIs. And as I talked to investors and as I went through the program, we've just kept up with, with those weekly updates. And it's, it's become two things for me. One, it's a very powerful way to build a relationship with investors who are not on your cap table yet, but who you might want to be on your cap table at some point in time. Uh, and two, just what I'll call strategic resources. They don't necessarily have to be investors, but maybe they're connectors. Um, maybe they just have a line incentives in some way, shape, or form. And sending out that weekly update with your, your key performance indicators and reporting on how you did and the good, the bad, and the ugly, and just being very transparent about how it's going. Uh, it's been very cathartic for me as a founder, um, as well as a very good way to keep the rest of our team and myself on track, right? Because we know we've got these people that we need to be accountable to uh, every week. And so, you know, our, our updates go out every Wednesday night and we know that we, we've got to, we've got to hit our goals uh, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, report on everything uh, in, in those updates. And, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from those. Do you use the same update for both 
existing investors, prospective investors, and team, or do you have like three variations? Today we do. We keep it all. We keep it all one audience, and and try to make it as transparent as possible. Obviously, there are a number of things that that we don't share in those updates uh, that that we have internally. If it's anything proprietary, but there's a there's a lot going on in the business that is shareable, and uh, and again, I mean our. Uh, our mission is to effectively solve the affordable housing crisis. And so there, there are a lot of lessons that, uh, that I, I would want to be out there if I get hit by a bus tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do you think weekly is, I mean, that's a pretty aggressive cadence. I haven't heard too many pe people do it that frequently. You, you think that's the right uh, cadence? And do, do you ever worry investors are getting so many updates from you, they're tuning out a little? Or do, do people say that's the right amount of info from you? So it depends. So initially we, we got some pushback from investors who just said, don't send me weekly updates, maybe monthly or quarterly. Uh, I think part of that though is they're just not used to, to getting them from, from entrepreneurs. Uh, I would certainly recommend that entrepreneurs do them weekly, regardless of whether or not they send their, uh, their investors updates on a monthly cadence. For, for me, everything is opt-in. So if people did want them weekly, they can, they have that choice. Most yeah. people use it to get them weekly. Uh, and, you know, we try to make them entertaining as well. Just, just like a weekly newsletter. And we, we expect that, uh, that not everybody's going to read every one, but if they, if they choose to, they, they can come back, but our, our open rates are, are pretty good. So they, there are clearly a lot of people that are reading them. Do you, how, um, how large is the prospective investor list? Like, cause I think this, believe me, we, we make an investor update product at Founders Suite. I'm always telling founders, you got to start doing investor updates. So you're preaching to the choir about this. I'm just interesting some of the nuances and details. How large is your prospective list that you're sending this out to? It's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that offhand, but I, I would say, so we have 39 current investors. That's, okay. that's the worst thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, uh, out of out of the 4.6 million to have 39 investors is, is probably a much bigger cap table than what most people have. But I'd say our, our list of total uh, recipients is probably 120 or so okay. of, mm -hmm. on, on the updates. I don't know how many of those are, are prospective investors off the top of my head, but yeah. I, would, I would say at least 10. Do you know what, if you're able to share, what's your open rate? Because this is a question I had recently from one of our, our customers. <laughs> um, what's a good one? Yeah, yeah, we're, uh, uh, we're pretty high. We're, we're consistently in the 80s. Oh, okay, well, that's really high. Yeah, that's super high. Good. Cool, cool, cool. All right, very good. Um, anything else you would do differently or any other tips we haven't covered? Anything you would do differently if you're raising money for this business again? So hard to know about, um, you know, I, I think you can never start those, those communications too early. And I would just stress first and foremost, your first communication should not be asking for money. You yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, I effectively started fundraising, although I didn't realize it 12 to 15 months ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was a big one, not having a technical background, not having a network built up. Uh, the second thing that, that we did, which, which I know was different, but I think was very helpful in our case, was I started collecting commitments, written commitments, pretty early from independents, uh, from independent folks that either knew us, uh, knew what we were working on, or were mission aligned, and just, I knew we were in at any cost, mm -hmm. uh, not price sensitive. And so for those folks, even though I knew they would be dependent on a lead to a large extent, we got them to commit. And that commitment was conditioned on uh, a lead investor coming in at terms that were acceptable to them. But ultimately, they had to sign a piece of paper that said, I'm committing this amount, assuming these things go well. And just on those commitments, just from individual investors, we raised over four million bucks. Um, wow. Now, once we started getting a good amount of institutional interest, we had to push a lot of those investors down, which was painful. But at the end of the day, the vast majority of those folks, they didn't really care if they were in for 10,000 or 100,000. They just wanted to be in. They wanted to be part of this. And I think that was, that was a, 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 it's not something that I've heard a lot of people doing, but, but just 
keeping a tally of all of those commitments. And it's not necessarily from people that you, you traditionally think of as VCs, uh, but it's, it's people who you haven't had, um, uh, or you or who, you, who you have had that previous relationship with that already know who you are and that you're a person of your word uh, and that you will follow through. And those are the people who are most likely to invest in you, period, uh, regardless of what your business idea may be. And so the, the sooner that you can start to get those people on board, even if you're not collecting their checks, uh, just getting to collect commitments and then going back to the VCs and saying, I've already collected this much. These are the people who believe in me. And in some cases, you're able to, to, to compile a list of names who they may know uh, and they may have respect for. And, and the quicker you can start to get third party validation, I think the easier it is to, to build some momentum around your own. That's great. No, I like that. That's a fantastic tip or hack. Were you, what was in that sort of lightweight term sheet, or I'm assuming it's kind of a lightweight term sheet, the amount they could write and then just like summary of conditions or was there valuation or other terms that you're already? Yeah, it was one paragraph and, and it, it just said uh, effectively, there was no valuation set, said you agree to commit uh, this dollar amount to the round mm -hmm. so long as uh, you, are, um, you are amenable to the, the lead investor and their valuation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really what that allowed us to do is in some ways we, we set our own valuation right? Because we said, okay, we're going to raise 4 million bucks and we want to give 25% of the company away. So we're raising it at 12 million three. Uh, now in, in hindsight, if, if you want to close your round quickly, I would not recommend doing that. <laughs> uh, you know, I would not recommend setting your own valuation. We had term sheets at, at 6 million three and 9 million three that we just passed on because we already had 4 million in commits. And so we thought, well, well why, there would have to be a really compelling reason for us to sell more of the company for less money uh, if we're going to move forward with, with one of these other VCs. I think yeah. it's early to tell whether that's, whether that's good or bad, but, but we're certainly very happy with how the process turned out and, and the cap table that we've got. And just one more question on that, because this is just so interesting. I think people will really love it. Um, <clears throat> you would have a, a pitch meeting, and presumably you knew most of these people. You, you know, kind of asked them at the end, like, um, can I put you down for commitment? And we have this very simple, how do you sort of message this, right? We, we have this very simple term document I'd like you to sign, or how did you fra phrase it? Yeah, more or less. I mean, because the questions for more sophisticated investors, just independent angels, you would, you would always get the question, well, what are you thinking in terms of valuation? Uh, and in, in some cases, uh, Early on, we would just say, well, we don't have a lead yet, but assume that it's a valuation that's acceptable to you. Uh, would you be willing to commit if the valuation were acceptable to you? Uh, and, and the terms, obviously. Because those are the two things, the, the valuation and the terms that, that they're gonna question, and in some cases, who that lead is. So if, if you address those potential concerns up front, it's a lot easier just to, to, to get something from them. And, and I think that the biggest thing I would say is being very direct with those investors and what is the amount of money that you would be willing to invest if everything met your, your criteria. And then you find out if you're spending days and days of research and due diligence for this investor who's only going to invest $10,000 and it's probably not worth your time. Um, but it's a lot easier to, to put folks into, into different priority buckets if you just ask those direct questions really early and figure out a way to get to yes. Did you ask him at the time, like what valuation would be outside your comfort zone or did you kind of wait for that to? Uh, in, in some cases we did, it just depended on the conversation. Right. You know, some, some investors were, were very driven by what the valuation was. And some investors looked at, looked at our business and said, this is an enormous, uh, addressable market and we're not really sensitive, right? We're, if we, if we're investing 10 to a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the day, we want this thing to return a thousand X and the, your initial seed series valuation is not going to be, not going to be significant. I mean, you think about even a, a six versus a 12, um, 
you know, yeah. if you're a million dollar enterprise, then then it's it's not uh, it's still a really big win either way. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Okay, any um any thoughts on like because uh, you I think might be our first person from Atlanta. Any uh, plug you want to make for any Atlanta startup groups or things for people to check out if they're maybe a new entrepreneur in Atlanta? Yeah, we got started at Switch Yards, so certainly a big fan of that uh, of that network and ecosystem, and uh, they they've just got a, a great space and a great brand. Um, it's a co working space or uh, or something else. Um, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a co working space. They they do have space options, but it's it's really just focused on. Uh, B2C startups in Atlanta mm. uh, in the same way that uh, Atlanta Tech Village is focused on B2B. Okay. Um, and then ATDC has also been very helpful. They're actually sponsored by the state and run through Georgia Tech. But, uh, but in terms of just course outlines for how to start a business and, and how to run uh, a tech startup, ATDC was, was really very, very helpful. Uh, but other than that, I, w- I would encourage any entrepreneurs that are thinking about uh, – you know, thinking about relocating to Atlanta or, or thinking about relocating period to, to strongly consider it. It's just, it's a very deep pool of talent here, certainly with, with Georgia Tech and Midtown um, and a lot of, a lot of great engineers. And, and it's a certainly a lot, a lot cheaper to hire talent here than it is in a lot of areas around the country and a lot cheaper to live. Yeah. Very good. Is pad split only in Atlanta or do you have multiple locations? Yeah, we have five jurisdictions in Atlanta today or in, in the Metro area. Uh, we hope to, we'll be at a thousand units here by the end of the year, we think, and uh, we'll have entered two other, two other metros. Awesome. So if anyone wants to learn more, it's simply padsplit.com. That's it. Right. Anything you want to promote or plug anything? Uh... No, that's it. We're hiring. <laughs> we're always, we're always hiring. So uh, if anybody's interested, just uh, let us know. Very good. All right, Atticus, this is really good. C- covered some new ground here, which I'm pleased to to do in our 100 plus episode. <laughs> so this is great. Um, well, thanks so much. Good luck. Sounds like a great and noble cause. We need it out here in the Bay Area desperately. <laughs> I don't know. The economics maybe are different out here, but yeah, no, we'll hopefully, uh, hopefully make it that way soon. Good. All right, sir. Thank you much. Have a good week.